throughout this uh, symposium, because it is of a slightly different flavor than others, normally whenever a speaker comes up, I like to give a very robust introduction to their history, to their life. But the way that these talks are being structured as not academic papers, but personal reflections, it means that the speakers themselves can really introduce their life far better than I can. So my introductions are going to be very minimal. Uh, all I wish to say here at this point is that it's an honor and a privilege and a pleasure for me to introduce our first speaker today, Matushka Maria Patapafa, who is from the Franco-Rus tradition, someone who knew Vladika John. And it's a great joy for me to welcome you, Matushka, because of your connection to St. John in Europe. Uh, most people here in San Francisco and in the United States know St. John's life almost exclusively through the miracles associated either in Shanghai or in San Francisco. But there is a great gap uh, about his life to a lot of people in this country uh, in terms of what happened in Western Europe. I happened to meet St. John, not in person, but meet him as a saint meet his tradition when I was living in Europe. And so all the stories that I heard about him were the stories that are told in France and Belgium and England, which are a completely different set of memories than the people have here. So it's a joy to be able to welcome someone who's able to speak to us of both of these traditions from her own first-hand experience. Joining us then from Washington, D.C., the wife of Archpriest Victor, who will talk to us a little later in the day. Please join me in welcoming Matushka Maria Patapova. First, I would like to ask your indulgence for my disorganized presentation, because there is so much I would like to share with you, but I will not be able, because of the time allowed to me, and also, uh, well, I'm not a professional speaker. And also, forgive my English, as it is not my first language. It's a foreign language for me. My first language is French and Russian, are French and Russian. Um, my recollection of Vladika, John, are those of a child. And uh, Fazili May spoke about Europe and so on, but now it's more, it's a child recollection. Vladika was assigned as the ruling bishop of Western Europe in 1951, and I was born in 1950. And as a, as much as I can remember myself, uh, the first 12 years of my child my childhood, my life were next to Vladeka because my father was his protodeacon for over 10 years. And he had no other deacon but my father and a lot of intimate and very nice memories. Um, and they traveled together with my father throughout all Europe. As my father liked to say in Russian, мы с Владикой раскалесили вдвоем всю Европу. Um, and my father is Father Serge Chertkov. I was born Chertkov. My mother is Radyanka. You probably all heard of Bishop Basil Radyanka. He is my mother's uh, younger brother. And my father um, he is from the Chertkov family and he became a deacon after he went, he was in a concentration camp in Romania and he uh, promised to himself that if he will be one day in freedom, he will serve God and people. And this is when he, by miracle, got through the Iron Curtain, he very soon became a deacon, and very soon Vladika John came to Western Europe. And then he, for 22 years, he was a deacon, and then for uh, the rest of his life, he was an archpriest. My mother's family, the Radyanka's family, they knew Vladika when they lived in Serbia. Bishop Basil Radyanka was greatly influenced by Vladika to serve the church. St. John taught him the law of God when he was a small child, and 
the Bishop Basil um, recollections on Vladika are very rich, emphasize Vladika's spiritual nature, but this is accessible. Um, when I was a kid, I was never told that Vladika was a saint. Being a child, I couldn't understand intellectually what saint, sainthood is, but I felt it with all my being. It was a fact. I had no, no question about that. Children very often understand and feel better than adults. And I'm convinced about that when I became an adult and I stopped to feel and understand as much as I can guess children understand and feel. I was fascinated by Vladika. I was always drawn to him. I noticed everything that was happening around him. So it's very strange and it has a very strong impact on me. Um, I was never afraid of him in the country. He loved children and lo children loved him. And when he was, um, he was able to communicate with children in their own level. He never left the impression of being somebody inaccessible, important, different. No, he was very kind, very gentle, very loving, very warm. Um, I knew that I knew from my early childhood that he was never going. To, he was never going to bed. <laughs> I remember. Uh, we uh, later on I will tell you more about the different places where Vladika was in France. I I remember he, his cell, his kelia in Lesna Monastery, the Russian convent Lesna. Uh, and I remember entering his kelia, looking at his bed, and thinking to myself, "Wow." He never has to make that bed. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> and I was looking at his armchair. I remember that armchair, the color of it, and where it was exactly in the kelia. I knew that this is where he was resting and praying. Um, after Tubabao, where all his churches were, as you all know, intense. He came to the capital of France, Paris. Okay, it's not to Baba, it's not an island. And he had his own cathedral there. The cathedral of all saints of Russia. You know, the, he had one of his churches in Tubaba was all saints of Russia and one of the tornado at the end of the Tubaba uh, time, I think it was destroyed, and they managed to save all the, the chalices, icons, and everything. And when he came to Paris, well, his parish from Tubabao well, became there, and it was a cathedral. And that cathedral was in a garage, a small garage, Rue Ribera. For, he, for Vladeka, it was quite probably easy for him to switch from tents to a garage. <laughs> and Vladeka was a very humble person. And my father liked to remember that uh, how they served the service of triumph of orthodoxy with an anathema in that garage. And Vladika never even had uh, his Dikiri Trikiri, my cousin, who you all know very well, Alona Chertkova de Rossi. She was also going, we were together going to the church. She was coming very early for the service to craft or prepare with candles 
sort of dikiri trikiri from Ladeka. And then just a few, few moments from the life in this small church. It was unbelievable. I remember that door of the garage it would roll up in metallic and aluminum and roll down. It looked a little big for me because I was very small, but at the same time I know it was very, very small. Um, we, um, in that church at that time, the starost of the church was Vladimir Musin Pushkin. He was a very well-known gentleman. I don't know his patronymic because I was calling Dedia Melodia. He is one of our distant uncle. He was telling a story. Um, I don't know if, if people will believe it or not, but at least we know that it comes from um, somebody we know. Vladik, as you know, after liturgy, he stayed a long time. First, he was consuming the holy gifts, but he would not come out of the altar. Immediately, he would spend time in the altar. And the, it took a very long time, and at one point, um, Mr. Musin Pushkin got a little bit concerned, and he opened the ticken door slightly, and he suddenly saw with his own eyes Ladika John praying in, on his knees, but but uh, he saw him uh, not on the floor. He was elevated, no, on not not zimlyoy stayal chichut na kalenya, and he was so shocked and taken by that that he immediately retreated, went to the church and started to pray, pray and pray because he had to get over the words. It's something which Natalka and Alona just reminded me. Of. We were talking on the phone yesterday because we, we it's, it's quite a moment. I don't know if it was somewhere noticed in his life, at Sergei. Have you ever heard about that? Well, at least we know that the, it was not an anonymous witness. He was praying in levitation. And there was also a moment uh, in that church uh, on Holy Saturday, one of the readers was reading the, the, the Old Testament, reading Parimi, and uh, Vladika fell asleep. He was in the middle of the church. And since Vladika was sleeping, the reader decided that he could skip a few pages of the reading. <laughs> As soon as he made that decision, suddenly Vladika woke up. <laughs> and Vladika knew exactly how many pages he just skipped. <laughs> and it's important. But I know that there is a lot of stories like that with Vladika. Um, beside this church in the uh, uh, rue, um, uh, uh, the name of this garage, huh? Rue Ribera. Vladika spent a lot of time in, the, in Versailles, uh, in the Cadet Military Institute, if we can call it a school, Kadetsky Corpus. He loved that place. He had also his own cell there and a church. And we spent quite a, a often time there because my father was serving in Versailles every time Vladika was there. And uh, I also remember very well that place. But what was interesting and memorable for me is that um, when I was there, I began noticing that Vladika was always surrounded by many destitute people, uh, dysfunctional families, uh, single mothers, alcoholic fathers, very tragic, poor situation. But Vladik was always caring for these people. He was their father, he was their consoler, he took over their burden. And as a child, I was seeing that. How come? I don't know, because it impressed me for the rest of my life. It was a very, very strong 
impact. I couldn't forget it even today. I can't forget. Vladika indeed was a living saint. In those days in Paris, they had a Catholic uh, conference of seminarians, and the topic of the conference was sainthood, and the seminarians were doubting that sainthood exists in our days, it belongs to the past, and so on. And um, the professor, or there was a theologian, a Catholic theologian, who said, what are you talking about? In the street of Paris, we have Saint Jean Vanupier, Saint Jean the Barefoot. This is how, what they call him. Even if people like to call him the barefoot. I personally never saw him barefoot. I saw him in his sandals, and probably everything Vladika Piotr yesterday explained, he was probably right. He was barefoot in churches probably when he had to stand a long time on his feet if he doesn't lay down in his life long uh, life. <laughs> And, uh, but otherwise, I never remember him being barefoot. He had indeed a bloated uh, stomach. I was always looking at his stomach, couldn't understand how, how come, because he was very skinny, but the stomach was bloated, and I knew that he was never eating, barely eating. But then I found out, and I was told that he was always wearing under his areas of the holy gifts, relics, and a copy of a Kursk icon which was given to him. Um, well, it's enough to, to make his stomach bigger, but probably he also had a vadyanka, as Vladika explained to us yesterday. And now we have, beside the Rue Rémy, uh, Ribera, pardon, uh, the Versailles, and we had the convent of Liesna, the woman convent. And Vladika knew that convent from Serbia. And uh, this convent was a center in our childhood. This convent was a center of, uh, or, or the Russian Orthodox Church in Europe. We all, I spent, we children of our family, we are six children and four girls and two boys, but we, mostly the girls, we spent a lot, a lot of time in that convent. Nikolai also. We loved that place. And Vladika also loved that place and had his own Kalia and he served all the time, as you know. And um, what's interesting, one day in that Kelia, I happened to be in his Kelia, and I found myself as a very little kid in between him and Abbas Fyodora, who was a magnificent, wonderful abbess. And somehow I was everywhere all the time. I don't know how come I was there between them, and I don't know if they noticed me, but I was there <laughs> and I witnessed, I witnessed an interesting moment when Matryka Fyodora, which was a very strong woman, very intelligent, very wise, and very kind, she was able to have all these rare qualities for a woman. <laughs> Not emotional and with a lot of humor, but unbelievably kind. And she was very strong and she was ordering Vladika to get into his bed because he was sick, very sick. And she was really an emprikazava. And Vladika flatly refused. And I was a witness being a very small kid they were probably so much involved in that co contact at that moment, they didn't pay attention to me, as they didn't notice to me. But I noticed them. And also, I have to tell you that in Liesna, we girls 
were very lucky to be out of the altar, altar servers. I don't know if you know that, but girls in Liesna were the altar servers without entering the altar. There was no boys in the altar. And we were doing everything the boys are doing normally. Holding Vladika's staff, the candle, at the royal door. I remember holding the water bowl with the towel on my shoulder for the washing of Vladika's hands. And I loved when Vladika was splashing my face with water. <laughs> We participate in the small entrance, the great entrance. And yesterday, I don't know if he's here today, our dear friend Vladimir Galitsyn from New York, he uh, told me yesterday that uh, he, one day of his life, a long time ago, he was a long time starosta in New York, in the Synod, and he told me that he held Vladika's staff once in Brooklyn, and that he was afraid of him, of the Deca. I have to admit that I hold, hold it, his staff many, many, many times, and I was never, never, never afraid of the Deca. <laughs> and I remember when he would have a sermon, I would give him his staff, kiss his hand, and stay on his left, right next to him, very happy. I was probably six, seven, eight years old, something like that. And he let, he, I was not told, okay, give the stuff and go somewhere and wait. No, I was standing next to him, and Vodiko would have his sermon and then would give me his stuff back. <laughs> Little details, you know, this is a memory of a child. And there was a, a, an, on Pentecost one time, during the kneeling prayers, I was holding the prayer in front of Vladika. He was on his knees, and I start to play with with the candle. I was playing with the candle, and Vladika stopped the reading of the prayer, looked at me, and said, tss, tss. <laughs> <laughs> "I will never forget." Oh well, Vladika never had a car or a driver, well, if he doesn't have a car, he doesn't have a driver. He used public transportation, and he walked, and he managed to be at the right time to the right person, at the right moment, praying, helping for a forgotten, very sick or dying person. And you probably read a lot of stories like that. Nobody knows how he managed sometime to appear somewhere. My own sister, Alexandra, my older sister, she was very sick, uh, ill when she was a kid. And she would tell us that she's laying in bed in the hospital and suddenly she, see, she hears stuk, stuk, stuk. And then she sees Vladika approaching to her, bending over her, smiling, blessing her, put press work on her stomach and leave. This is how he was, you know, doing his roles. But it was also a very consoling visit for a child from Ludwika. Uh, I'll tell you one story. Uh, we, Ludwika, a lot of miracles were happening in his lifetime, and many, many miracles now since 50 years ago. My brother Nikolai, who was a year and a half older than my twin sister and I, Anna, he had a very, very close friend, René, a French boy. And Nikolai loved him dearly. And René got sick with cancer, leukemia. In those days, it was not like it is today. And he suffered a lot. Ladika was praying for him. And then suddenly we got the news that René passed away. And Nikolai had a very, very 
that reaction. He was in total shock. He closed himself in his bedroom. He wouldn't talk to anybody. He wouldn't eat. He wouldn't drink. And my parents didn't know what to do with him. And we lived in the suburb of Paris, not far from Versailles, in Flay, we had no telephone, no nothing. And suddenly I hear the doorbell. I go, open the door, and I take The first thing he tells me, I came to see Kola. He was called Kola. He blessed me, and he went up to his bedroom, straight to his bedroom. How did Vladika find out about what happened? Only God knows. And indeed, he was amazing. He went upstairs, he closed, the, he entered the room, closed the door, and spent a long, long time with my brother, who was in a really bad shape. And he got him back to his own sense and he consoled him. Nikolai probably will remember for the rest of his life this time spent with Vladika. And then Vladika decided, well, it was time for him to leave. And uh, to, to leave, uh, he had, to, it's a walk, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes walk to the train station. And I had the desire to go with Vladika to accompany him. I always liked to be next to him. I knew that he looked different. He looked strange. Uh, people we, would pay attention to me, but I could care less. And the, the fact that I wanted to be with him was more important for me than the way he looked. When I was a little kid, it was not so important. The adults pay more attention to this. And um, I remember Vladika walking with me, and very, very sweetly he would bend over to be at my level and was conversing on my level, some, telling me some very nice things, you know, very sweet. And we came to the train station, we were standing on the platform waiting for the train, there was nobody there, and then Vladeka boarded the train, stood in front of the door, open door of the, um, of the wagon, car, and he started to do his uh, uh, bish blessing with two hands. And I was standing all alone on that platform, and he was non-stop blessing me, non-stop. And I was like that. <laughs> and then the door closed, he was continuing, and the train started to move, and he was continuing, and he was blessing me as long as he could see me, and as, until the train disappeared from my view. And this is something I, re I suddenly it came back to my memory when I became a young adult. And we, I married Father Victor and we start our life in the church. And you know how it goes in the church. It's not too easy to become a priest and a priest wife and you go. And this is when I remembered Vladika very vividly and I had this feeling that he blessed me. <laughs> Perhaps he knew more about me than they can imagine. I was a little kid and I was going to be in the parish. He found it uh, when he was trying to help the, his flock from to leave to Babao. This is like a closed circle because from Serbia, Shanghai, from Shanghai to Babao, from Tudabat to Babao, he had to go to Washington to save all his people. And th during that moment, because of to thanks to Tubabao, we have that parish in Washington. He, come, he's a, he created that parish, he found it, and he served the first service on the day of St. John's um, beheaded St. John. And his condition was to remain and to have that feast day on that day, which is a very rare feast day for a parish, because it's a very strict Lent that day. But Imagine uh, September 11 in the capital of the United States. It's a little providential, okay. Uh, and then Vladika came to you here, to California. I know that you, you feel that he's yours, some Shanghai and San Francisco, but I have to tell you that uh, he's not only Shanghai and San Francisco. We, forgot about 
10 years in Europe, uh, is a Western European uh, uh, bishop, but also Washington. And he's very much alive in our parish today. I'm not sure I will have time to tell you everything. And beside the, mon the convent and the, the Kadyatsky Corpus and the Ribera, Vladika liked to go to the summer camp, Vitizi. We had a, a summer camp in the Alps. And Vladika, when he was coming to the camp, he had his own tent outside of the camp in the wood. And uh, I liked to to I was I, I liked to leave the camp to go to Vladika without asking. Just I liked to, to be with him and interesting. He never told me, go back. Never, never. He led me to be there. And when I was coming to him, he was sitting in his tent, tent typing. He has his typewriter all the time. I'm joking and not joking that if Rodeka would be alive today, he probably would have a laptop all the time with him. He was constantly working. He was caring for his priest, his clergy, and his flock to the smallest details when my sister Marina spent some time with you here working on the archives, she very kindly made copies for Father Victor of uh, all his ukase, handwritten ukase, when he was in Europe. Oh my goodness, the details, the, the attention, the care he had. I think it's a textbook for all of our bishops. Because it's so important when the bishop cares about the priest and the flock. And he was one, one unique bishop. Uh, and he, he wouldn't tell me to go back. He would let me play on the grass uh, with sticks and insects. And he would always feed me with almonds. Probably almonds was his food. And he was just sharing with me. Uh, well, I don't know, perhaps I should uh, skip some of my thoughts, but you probably heard about a miracle which happened in Nayak, New York, with St. John. Why I like to talk about this, because the witness of that miracle are also my very close relative. My uncle, Vladimir Tolstoy, he's a grandfather of Father Alexander Serendinaki, and my cousins. I don't know if you heard about that story. Do you know that story? Yes? Can I? Uh, Vladika came to serve the liturgy in Nayak, New York. In those days, Atiyat Serafim Slabatskoy was the rector. You probably all heard about Atiyat Serafim. He was a wonderful priest. He was a real father of his, father, of his parish. He wrote that famous the Konboje Law of God, which was published and republished and republished. And he was absolutely besirebrenik, how do you say it? Uh, unmercenary. Unmercenary, totally, totally. Devoted to the church and people. He would know if any problem would happen among his flock, he would immediately go there and to settle everything, console. He would not pass by without attention. And he knew every single person in that village. Vladika, when he finished the service, he had, was scheduled to leave very soon to take an airplane to go somewhere, and it was really tight schedule. And my uncle was supposed to drive him to the airport. And Vladika went out to the church, said, no, I'm not going anywhere, find me. And he gave the name of a person. Well, Vladika, sorry, but we don't know that person, and you probably are confusing because we know everybody. And Vladika was stubborn. He said, no, I'm not leaving. You have to find me. And he was so vehement about finding that person and going anywhere until he can see that person that he literally overturned the whole Nayak. And somehow through somebody, through I don't know how many people, they found that person. And my uncle took him there. 
At the moment when Vladika entered the apartment of that woman, she was ready to commit suicide. At this exact moment, Anna Nakladovla na I don't know how to say that in English. Uh, she was at the moment, and he stopped her, and he talked to her, and he brought her back to life, and he gave her to Father Seraphim. And you better believe it, that Father Seraphim took, took good care of that lady. And Vladika left, and he, the airplane was waiting for him. This is one of Vladika's unbelievable, incessant miracles to the smallest details. A miracle doesn't need to be, I don't know, extraordinary, some big event. The smallest details is are very big miracles, but it would accompany Vladika's life all the time. Uh. Okay, now this is okay. I like to remember this story with Vladika. There is another story I will tell later if we have time. But uh, my childhood was blessed, blessed by Vladika. And Vladika, I'm sure, did a big, played a big role in my life. And for a period of time, when he left for San Francisco, and I was, what, 12, 13, I saw him when, I guess, he came back to Paris to bless the church in Claude Lorrain. He helped us to get a new building, a house, to transform the house into a church, and he was one, the main bishop who blessed that church. But in my recollection, he came from San Francisco. And that's it. And then, until when I came to America in my early 20s, I was 20 years old, and we married with Father Victor. Then Vladika, he, he reappeared in my life, in our life, with Father Victor, with us, well, he, in our life. Uh, first of all, when, when the first parish where we, St. Father Victor served, was in Stratford, Connecticut. We had a, a first child, Matvey, who didn't live long. He died after eight days, but he was baptized. He even received communion. He's buried in Jordan. But then uh, I got pregnant with Mark, our oldest son, and uh, I had a serious problem. I started to bleed profusely. And even a doctor team came to our home and diagnosed me with a miscarriage and decided to take me to the hospital. In those days, they didn't have any sonograms, no nothing, you know, the only things they had a blood test and that's it. And I don't know why the doctor decided to let the nature to do its course and not to do a DNC which would have terminated completely the pregnancy. And I came back home uh, bedridden and uh, bleeding. And Vladika Filariet was very close to us. He ordained Father Victor Deacon and later priest, and he was very often visiting us. And he served a Malebin to St. Pantilemen. And I was uh, bleeding. And then Father George Levin uh, came, Father Victor at the time was a deacon in New York, and I don't know if it was Father Victor or Father George, they uh, asked, we asked Father George to have a panihid and not we, I don't know, Father George initiative to, in those days we were all the time serving panihidas to St. John and Lajana Xenia together. Both of them were online to be canonized, and everybody was serving all the time in all the churches, Panihida, Panihida, and this was like the, the uh, praslavlenia, or the <coughs> glorification of those saints. And when Tzitz Georgi wanted to have that Panihida, I was a little bit confused. I said, listen, I don't feel right. 
Владыка Филарет шот панихиду ту сен пантилебен. Пардон, пан малебен ту сен пантилебен. И но, ай, но, вы ас, вы, окей, пантилебен, сен пантилебен не помогает? Окей, давайте go and look for somebody else who might help. We have to, нужно положиться на волю Божию, we have to accept the will of God and not going and shop for a different saint. And Father George gave me a very good answer. He smiled and he told me, listen, St. Patilemen is proclaimed by God and Church for centuries. And now the will of God is to canonize and proclaim St. John and blessed Ksenia. And how do you want? This is a way to proclaim them. And I like this answer. He answered well. And he saw the panichida, and my bleeding stopped right away. I couldn't believe it. You know, I hear about miracles, and you always think that the miracles first it takes time, and or it happened to somebody else, but you never can imagine that it can happen to you. And like this, it's very difficult to imagine. And the the, the bleeding stopped. And when I came to the doctor, I will never forget, the doctor told me, are you still pregnant? And Mark is 42 years old now. <laughs> he has three children, and a lot of you probably know him. Okay, among young people, he lives in Sick Leaf now. <laughs> and we know this Vladika entered our life very quickly with Father Victor and I. And as you all know, mostly priest and matushki, parish life is always accompanied by trial and various tribulation. And probably it's necessary for building up wisdom, patience, love, prayer, everything. And forgiveness, this is the most important. This is a victory. And we had those tribulations in both parishes, once in Stratford and once in, in uh, Washington. And Vladika every time came to our rescue. Um, at Stratford, um, the tribulation came in the form of slanders and truths, but it was the most difficult to accept that we were very young with pink glasses, rosy glasses, you know, idealistic, and very, very young. And this was coming from adults who were the generation of our parents, and intelligence, you know, people, Yale University, blah, blah. These people were supposed to give us an example or support. And one night after the vigil, we heard again something on that topic. And I was completely uh, discouraged, disappointed. I was in a very bad mood. And Father Victor was sitting in the living room in an armchair, and I started to talk. And I was saying stuff to Father Victor, which I knew that I was wrong, but I was still say, saying it. I was, I was telling him all of that, knowing that I was wrong. And I was asking him, yes, why did you become a priest? Uh, what, 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 what good are we doing? Because of us, these people fall into temptation. What's the meaning of it? Blah, blah. It's like a group I wasn't, you know, when you start, you cannot stop. <laughs> and, and, he, and he let me talk. He didn't say anything. He let me talk. After a while, he, said, he very nicely told me good night. <laughs> but in those days, for the victim was um, uh, working because the parish was very small, very poor, and couldn't 
he couldn't, we couldn't survive on the church parish salary, and he was working in New York City, Bedford Publication, blah, blah, and he was at the, on the verge to lose his job, or already lost, I don't remember, and we knew that he ha had to look for something for work. And, um, but for one year he was on unemployment, it was the best year of our life. <laughs> was very, not only because of that, but that same night after all my stupid talk, uh, Father Victor had a dream and Vodeka came to him, but he didn't tell us about that right away. He didn't want to share this feeling, he didn't want to land back to earth, he wanted to keep that night he had with Vodeka for himself for a while. And then one day he told us that that same night, Odeka came to him and told, uh, start to talk to him with a question. Ты не жалеешь, что стал священником? Don't you regret? Do you regret that you became a priest? And it was directed to me. Он прямо в мой огород, как говорят, you know. <laughs> it didn't came to me, but it was because of me that he asked that question. And uh, Father Victor told him, no, I don't regret. And Rodeka said, well, I do not regret. And he started to talk to him during the whole night about a very important future work he will have in his life for the church and for Russia. And it was a year before he got to work at the Voice of America, and he was for 30 years doing the religious broadcast throughout the entire Soviet Union. He, at one point, he was responsible for 16 hours a week of religious broadcast. The most, in those days, was a lot, a lot. And in his wildest imagination, he would not imagine this to happen. I cannot talk on de in details about that, but when Father Victor mentioned to us that Vodeka told him about something he has to expect in his life, and we were asking him, but what? What did he tell you? Just give us details. He said, you can kill me, but I don't remember, which is true, he didn't remember. The only thing he knew that he doesn't have to worry, something very important will happen in life in the future. And that's why he was so peaceful when you're in unemployment. And when he stopped with his work and life at the West of America, it's a separate, long, it's a very amazing the way he got into it because he, normally he couldn't. He's a young man from Germany, he's not a journalist. He was like from the young man from the street. Well, we agree with that. <laughs> but St. John always was next to him. He was doing a lot of the voice of America, what he was not supposed to do. He never wanted to be promoted, blah, blah, blah to get not, he didn't want people to pay too much attention to him and to what he was doing. And he always had Vodica John in front of him in his little cubic like where he was working. Okay, I'm talking too much, I'm very sorry. Uh, but uh, our life in Washington, well, there was also another incident. Um, in our life in Russia, at one point we had also big, a big uh, sad problem in the parish. Thank God it's over, it's forgotten a long time ago and everything is beautiful now, peaceful, normal. But in those days it was very, very difficult. And one of my big uh, thoughts that uh, I speak out my mind too easily. <laughs> and for me to keep my mouth shut is very challenging. <laughs> and if 
if I don't zip my my my, I can do a lot of damage. And the situation was very critical. And because of that situation, I was a little upset. I couldn't understand how come these things happen and so on. And it, I couldn't go to confession and communion because I didn't understand how come you can have a situation like that and still go to confession and communion as if nothing is happening. It doesn't go together. In order to go to confession and communion, you have to be in peace with everybody and not having this kind of horrible problems. At the same time, well, God was sending us all the time a lot of people in need. This is Vladika's parish, and Vladika makes sure that we always have people in need. <laughs> but he's always there to help us. But uh, in those days, the benevolent life of our parish was not yet so well organized as it is now. And um, it was not easy at the moment, and I had to invent a way of doing it, invent money, believe it or not, you can invent money. <laughs> and <laughs> people were criticizing me a lot. And um, they would criticize me, oh, you're crazy, you take uh, money from the mouth of your children, stupid, it's impossible in America. <laughs> And, and not, but I know, I understand what they were trying to tell me, but I, I had no choice. But one, one day, I was uh, driving, I remember, and I got very upset. I remember I was thinking to myself, yes, these people are right. I'm completely crazy. And I accepted that, yes, they are right. I'm not right, probably. I'm off. And uh, everything together, the problem in the parish, this problem. And now, this is how many times Vodeka came to me. I will never forget. He came to me at night. He was in his mind, the village student, you know, he was grandiose and very strict. And in the strict, this uh, moment with Radeka this night was in two poor parts. The first part was very strict, watching strict. And he told me, mm, zip you, Zakrero. But believe me, if I managed to do it, and I did it, and nobody would believe it was possible, and I didn't believe it also, it was thanks to Vladika, otherwise, believe me, nobody would be able to figure out what is what and who is who. And then Vladika very strictly told me, you have to go to communion, you have to go to confession and communion. And he put me on my knees and started to confess me. And then the second part, he changed totally. He became very kind, very gentle, very soft. He bent it for me and he whispered to my ear, um, please uh, help me, он сказал мне, чтобы твое сердце не смущалось. That your heart not be troubled. Continue to do what you're doing. And he opened my hands, and he put money in my hands. And that mo money multiplied. And the crisis I had those days, fixed. Don't ask me how, fixed. But to tell you, uh, unfortunately, I very often forget about that dream, because if I would remember it more often, I would be accepting more easily all the incessant, you know, when people come ask for help, it's difficult. You know, Vladika, uh, he was never wait, waiting for people to knock into his door to help people. He was looking for these people, he was searching for them, he was finding them, and we barely accept 
the послушание, the will of God when people knock into our door. Because we all like to have privacy. We all, we all like to rest a little bit. But life is life and people, we can stop. And mostly if you are in the church and if you are a priest and people, where do they go? They go to the church, not to us. And um, it's not easy, I can tell for myself. And what's um, uh, easiest is to, here, oh, take this money, I'll serve my living, take $100 and goodbye. No, it doesn't work like that. It has to be constant, non-stop, non-stop. And as soon as one case is settled in a good shape and goes on its own, there is another one on the way, another one at the doorstep. And but Vladika is constantly helping. This parish is Vladika's parish, and. Uh, in our parish life, the benevolent work became a lifestyle. It's normal. People never ask, uh, never, never question if we need to help somebody or not. There is no condition. You know? And it's amazing. And this is Radhika's protection and his prayer. Because the parish life, it's important. The most important is benevolence and help people, and we have to do it when we don't have money. Because if we don't learn how to help without money, we will never learn how to help with money. It's true. And we always have to take a piece of ourselves. Otherwise, it's, not, it's nothing. And uh, what is wonderful is that Ladika managed this parish, is that it became like the heartbeat of the parish, the blood flow of the parish. And the longer we will do that, the better it will be for the parish. For God will always provide. You know, people so very often they think that we have a lot of money because it's known that the parish does a lot of benevolence. We don't have any money. We collect money, and the money goes directly to the cause. Direct. And we, when we collect money, we always round up that sum of money. Either the church round up of somebody else, or the sisterhood, but money doesn't sit. So very often people come to us and ask, can you give money from your foundation, from your benevolent fund? Well. We can try to raise some money, but we were always on, we are always in the hole. But we never know until the end of the year how much we manage during the year. Sometimes we have like hundred fifty thousand dollars. We need money for it. You know, we, which is what is great is that people stop even to comment and say, "Oh, we should collect for the church for the need of the church, but not for the benevolence." Aha. You know what? If we collect for the church, we'll never collect as much. And if we don't help people, God will not help us. Period. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> we had beautiful miracles with people we had. We helped. I don't know if we have time or not. Five minutes. <laughs> okay. Ten minutes. <laughs> I love one story, but you probably know it because I had this lady who took an interview with me, which was the translation was really nothing. I asked, no, but we didn't translate it into English. We don't know who did it, but that's okay. But the Russian text, she, worked, she did a good job. I did not expect that because uh, usually the journalists always manage to change everything, to distort. Somehow she didn't really, and, and well. 
But I don't know if you read it, I'm not going to repeat myself. Perhaps it's not necessary. Okay. Um, <laughs> in those days when I was, uh, we had a house not far from the church where all these bitter lucky, all these poor people were living, but we had to feed them. And again, again, uh, I didn't know where to find the money to feed them, short money. It was in the old days. And I didn't want to share that problem with Father Victor. I figured out this is my problem. Because he has enough of his own problem. And I didn't share with anybody. It was Lent. Went to church. I bought the biggest candle, a really very long one, for $3. And in those days, Fadika was not yet canonized, but we already had a beautiful fresca on the large, long pole of our church, very beautiful, on the Vissoros Grasspissen. We were anticipating the canonization, that's why we didn't lose our time. And I came to that icon, to the fresco, there was a candle stand. I put that candle, and I said, well, they could give me money. <laughs> it was all my prayer, nothing else. <laughs> give me money, period. And uh, it was like Father Victor had those catechism uh, talks in the church hall of the liturgy. And I was standing in the back, and a lady came to me and, no, somebody tapped me on my back, I turned, and this lady gave me a very large check. And she told me, here, take that for your bitter laggy, for your poor. I was in total shock. Nobody knew about my problem. Nobody. I said, only what they can, God. I was in shock. She saw my reaction. She asked for explanation. And I explained to her. And she started to smile, she laughed, said, Masha. Don't pray too often to Latika, otherwise we'll get bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> we have stories like that. Believe it or not, not because Latika, Peter yesterday said Latika, John has a lot of humor, but I believe in that. And I believe that God has a lot of humor. I know, I said, yeah, I'll end in that. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but the last words I'd like to share with you. You know, to have known Ladika John is a big responsibility. And it's an obligation. It's not a subject of pride or boasting. We don't deserve anything. It was not us who were doing that unbelievable poetic of lifetime poetic. We cannot boast about that. Otherwise, our veneration is meaningless. We have to try to follow in his footsteps as best as we can. By loving God, our neighbor, as ourselves, unconditionally. Then we'll never, God will never leave us and will always provide. We need to learn how to help the less fortunate. Again, I repeat myself, when we lack financial needs, otherwise we will never able to help. Sorry, I took too much of the time, my goodness. One hour? <laughs> <laughs>